Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Ruby Rogues podcast. I'm your host, Charles Max Wood, and this week's panel is, in no particular order, Avdi Grimm. He is the author of Exceptional Ruby. He blogs at avdi.org slash devblog, and you can find him on Twitter as at Avdi. Welcome, Avdi. Hello again. We also have Gregory Brown from Ruby Mendicant University. He is the author of the Prawn Library Ruby Best Practices and has a lot of experience helping developers kind of go from that uh, beginner or intermediate stage and move up. So welcome, Greg. Hey. We also have uh, from Shiny Systems, uh, David Brady. Shiny Systems is his company. And are you still hiring, Dave? Um, actually, I've got some really interesting developments going on this weekend. I am trying very hard to hire somebody and uh, trying also to avoid getting hired uh, outright. Uh, apparently, when you challenge the universe, the universe challenges back. All right. So uh, you can check him out. Uh, he blogs at HeartMind Code. He and Pat Maddox have an awesome podcast at addcasts.com. Yep. And he is also uh, the author of the tour bus library for load testing your application. So welcome, yep. Dave. And I'm at D Brady on Twitter. At D Brady on Twitter. All right. We also have uh, Josh Susser. Josh is one of the organizers of the Gogoruko, the Golden Gate Ruby Conference. Uh, he blogs at hasmanythrough.com. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at Josh Susser. Um, he's a he's contributed to the Ruby on Rails library some, and as we've said before, he has seven patents, which I think is rather unusual for software developers. Welcome, Josh. Uh, thank you. Good to be here. And we also have we we have a uh, one more than we normally have. We have James Edward Gray. Uh, James is the author of the TextMate book. Uh, he ran the Ruby quiz for a while and wrote the best of Ruby quiz. He um, he wrote the Faster CSV library, and you can find him on Twitter as JEG2. Welcome, James. Thanks. Glad to be back. And I'm Charles Max Wood. I have screencasts and a podcast at teachmetocode.com. I'm also the host of the Rails Coach podcast and this podcast. And uh, you can find me at uh, teachmetocode.com. I'm on Twitter as at CMaxW. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We're This week, as we said last time, we're going to be talking about metaprogramming. Um, this is one of the topics that was requested on the Ruby Rogues website. And uh, it seems like you guys have some uh, ideas of where you want to go with it. So I'm going to turn it over and just let whoever wants to jump in uh, get, get the ball rolling. So I thought an awesome question to start us off is, what is metaprogramming? Ooh, there's a deep one. What, what a meta question. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, since this is all meta, we're just going to sit here and think about the answers for a while. <laughs> can, can we think about thinking about the answers? Whoa! <laughs> well, deep. Let's not get carried away here. <laughs> okay, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll try a, an answer. This is Josh. Um, metaprogramming is uh, programming other programs. Yeah, I think that's pretty <laughs> much what I always used to define it as, was code that writes code. Although I kind of think Ruby blurs that line in a lot of areas. Yeah, I think that it's a, the question is uh, going to depend on whether you're talking about metaprogramming in general or metaprogramming in Ruby, because metaprogramming takes on a, I think, a more broader meaning um, in other languages. Where in Ruby, I always tend to think about the metaprogramming functionality as just uh, an API for dynamic programming within Ruby itself. I always thought I, of it as as a basically you writing code that defines other programmatic constructs. So this is going to be a fun day today because for me metaprogramming is uh, almost always. I mean, you, you, a lot of us will probably talk about like DSLs and that kind of thing. But for me, metaprogramming is is largely about monkey patching and duck punching and donkey patching, um, which is you know programming other people's programs uh, for them whether they want it to, you to do it or not. Um, but then in Ruby, I, I love the take. I think it was Giles Poquette that wrote, he blogged about it and basically said, there's no such thing as metaprogramming. There's just programming. 
So let's try a concrete example to see if we can zero in. Like in Rails, where you have your has many and belongs to or validates numericality of, which is so popular. Um, it, are those metaprogramming? Hmm. Well, I, 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 I don't think, think metaprogramming. so. Metaprogramming. I don't think of them as metaprogramming. They're just class methods. The, the, so I think that things like the um, like the associations has many that those things I do classify those as metaprogramming in their implementation. You're, using them, it looks just like an API. But when you call has many, or when you have a has many method in your class, has many comments, then uh, that defines a bunch of methods on your class. So you get the oh, that's method. true. Yes, right, that's what I was thinking about. I was thinking about how from the outside in, you can't actually necessarily tell. Like, I would consider it metaprogramming if it actually defines methods or otherwise messes with structures. But say, for example, it was just storing, like if you had a, a class method that takes blocks and then stores those blocks and calls them later, the, as, I don't know that I would consider that metaprogramming. So that's interesting. By that definition Greg just gave, the association methods are metaprogramming, but the validation methods would not be metaprogramming. So if it generates a class or generates a method. What about method missing? I, I was going to ask that. Because so, effectively you sorry, are... Sorry, go ahead and ask that. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well you're effectively <laughs> modifying the, the interface, right? I mean, it it accepts a message that it wouldn't have accepted otherwise if you... If you if you monkey around with method missing, well, but you're not defining yeah, a method you're, itself. You're not defining a method. All you're doing is you're saying my interface is extremely promiscuous. <laughs> well, well, it's, awesome. Or is it permissive? Like, okay, so that doesn't necessarily that doesn't define um, methods for you. That just changes the way that dispatch works. Right. Um, and then the question is, if method missing is a form of metaprogramming, then you need to sort of think of send as also being a form of metaprogramming in a way. Um, they sort of go together. Um, and I don't know that I feel that those things, like I actually am of the opinion that there really is no such thing as metaprogramming uh, in Ruby, at least. I just think of them as APIs that do various dynamic things, and um, I think that they're actually entirely different sort of things. Like I feel that defining a method and defining a hook for when a method doesn't exist are two very different things. Mm -hmm. So maybe for a working definition for today, maybe we could agree on something like uh, um, some chunk of code that modifies the object structure, uh, you know, in ways like uh, adding methods or, or uh, responding new methods or things like that, making new classes available, possibly. Basically, well, what, about, it, what about rewrite? Yeah, rewrite. I about Reg, Reg's rewrite, which, which actually does do kind of metaprogramming in a more classical sense where it's, it's generating new code. Right, that's code. the question about code generation and whether code generation should be considered metaprogramming. I think it would actually be more productive to talk about, you know, including all of the concepts of yeah. when we write code to, you know, make modifications to our code dynamically that would ordinarily be done by, you know, something explicit. You know, so metaprogramming yeah. is always implicit and dynamic. Yeah. Um, and its goal is to uh, provide a more generalized way to do something that could have been done statically. Right. Basically, if it's if it's something that will blow, this is David. Uh, if it's something that will blow the mind of a Java programmer, I consider it metaprogramming. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, so the entire Lisp language is metaprogramming. Yes. Yes. yes <laughs> absolutely. I agree. Uncontested. Yes. <laughs> All right, so let's try a new question. Let's come at it from a new angle. Wait, it's clear we have no idea what we're talking about today. We spent which is fantastic. No, no, we have, we have established that is a very important fact. We have established that we cannot define what this is. So that's the first thing you need to know about metaprogramming. So you just got the meta definition for metaprogramming. Basically. That's right. That's right. Well, it, it, well, if you if you take it from the thing that all of Lisp is is metaprogramming. If you say programs that treat code as data. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a good way to put it, yeah. 
But by that definition, I can think of quite a few block scenarios just using Ruby's blocks that I think would qualify as metaprogramming. So why don't we just change the topic to code as data and then just roll with that? <laughs> so well, but Ruby well, doesn't do code as data. It doesn't. It's not a... Interesting. Not a why do you say that, Avdi? Well, I mean, you can't, you cannot interrogate a um, a Ruby class and say, give me the. Uh, well, you can't say, give me the bytecode for your methods, and you also can't say, give me the um, the AST for your methods, and you can't yep. say, you can't even say, give me the text of your methods like you can with, I think, most JavaScript implementations. You can, you can get the source Actually, code. Actually, that's not it's, true in Run Nine, is it? No, it's not true. You can get I, source code. You can get AST. You can get all of you that. Can stuff. can you ask an object for it, or do you need to load in um, Ripper? Uh, well, I mean, Ripper is a standard library, so... Okay. I think you can actually get the source itself without Ripper. They now have a, uh, a, they have a source... source location method. Uh, oh. it's location. Source location. That's, that's a little different. You're right. Especially, yeah, if, it's been, on top especially of if the source if the source has been generated or changed at runtime. That's Good not going to give... Yeah, we have a list list of symbols that get mapped out into define method. Then you get that location, and you're like, "Oh, this this is just a for loop. I don't really see the source code here." I do That's believe you about the source code stuff. Um, now, so I guess let me think about this. Um, the source code stuff definitely works if you've got something that's in a file and then you can get the source because you can get the source location and then parse it from there. Um, but if you're dynamically generating code, could you get the source back? Um, probably not without some sort of ripper hack on that, and I'm not even sure that you could do it. I'm yeah, not sure. And you also, you still can't marshal. You still can't marshal code in Ruby. That's correct. There's a very good reason for that. The um, you know the concept of of a block in Ruby is a closure. So exactly. You know how do we properly marshal a closure and then bring it back with all that state? You know? Yeah. Exactly. Ruby, yeah. Great you difficulty. could use. I've actually considered forking Ruby just to add two little changes to it, which is that everything should be treated as an expression and it should return its value. Therefore, when you issue the class statement, when you say class pig truck, da 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 da, when you type end, that should evaluate and you should get back the definition of that class. And the same thing when you define a method with def foo, once you're done, you should get back a proc object. And Ruby doesn't do that. It returns nils from both of those, uh, those uh, evaluations, which is unfortunate. So I have a question on that then, Dave. If you monkey patch something then, would it return the value of whatever it is that you monkey patched, like the new class definition or whatever? Uh, in that case, you, I, I don't know that I, I – I definitely don't have the chops to just monkey patch Ruby straight. I think you'd actually have to patch – actually have to fork Ruby and change the source code, I think. So let's, let's uh, move on to a different angle outside of definitions. Yeah. I thought another interesting question might be – do you see too much or too little metaprogramming in Ruby? Yes. Definitely too much all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. I halfway <laughs> agree. The use of metaprogramming that I see is either wrong or has an equivalent that's less confusing. Then so again, I work with intermediate and beginner developers mostly. Yeah. yeah. So yes. that's an interesting point. You think we have a tendency maybe to to reach for the big tools when there's a simpler tool that would do? I like power tools. <laughs> yeah, but so easy. Like I did a lot more metaprogramming before I got more experience with Ruby. Yeah. So, Dave, you were, you were saying too much and too little. And um, too little, yeah.